Uh, good afternoon. I think it's time to start again. We are perfectly in time because the, the, some of the speakers have uh, trained to, to, uh, to leave. I think, uh, Flavio, you want to say something? You told me. Sorry, I forgot about that. Thank again, because I will have to leave uh, before the end of, the, of this afternoon session. Um, and I would like to pick up what you were saying before about memory. Carlo, at the end of his presentation, said that all the project about memory has the problem of finding funds. Because in fundraising, on anything which has to do with memory, uh, they tell him, this is not science, is it right? I think this is science. I guess I am a humanist myself, so I cannot say what science is, is what it should be. But my impression is that if there is any possibility for the humanities and sciences at large to overlap, is on memory. Um, and I guess um, the humanities have always been dealing with memory. Uh, science, um, apart from some specific fields of investigation, um, dealt with the future, progress, application, technology. Not only, of course, but the mission of science has, at least in the last two centuries, been taken as something which has to do with the future. Uh, I think it's high time science looked back, looked back at the past, as in Carlos' project, as in the projects you were discussing uh, this morning. And if science is able to change its paradigm into the discovery of what was, has been, and is, rather than what we would like it to be, um, there is a possibility that these two sides of man's thought, the humanities and science, may start to overlap better than they have been doing uh, till today. Um, I, I wish that this may happen someday. Um, probably it's a matter of um, funding, of money. Um, from what I read a few days about, uh, ago about the uh, uh, American funding of, of uh, pu public and, and private universities from the, the uh, um, general funds, the taxpayers' money. Um, there, isn't, th th there doesn't seem to be much room for that. I've seen that mu much of the money will go into uh, research um, on weapons, um, to put it bluntly. Um, and of course, that doesn't lead uh, humanity, uh, mankind, anywhere. So I hope that there is a change in the, in the way in which uh, not only scientists, but also those dealing with money uh, and those giving money to scientists uh, think um, that is, you know, we, we, we have to go back to what we have been, we, we were, and also the world, the world was and has been, is, will it be? Of course it will be, but something different from what um, we have seen so far. Um, when, when you were talking, some, um, the images of a film came back to my mind. That film is um, um, Spielberg's AI. May, I think you may have seen it. And if you remember, that film has to do with the flooding of most of uh, the United States and of the world and what happens of humankind uh, in, in, in an event like that. And uh, um, the ending of the film, I don't want to spoil it, but the ending of the film um, has to do with memory. There is a kind of alien, uh, kind of alien creatures coming from somewhere and, and studying this kind of puppet machine uh, which has inbuilt uh, a human DNA. And they try to find out what um, man was from the machine having this DNA implanted in it. Um, we won't be uh, eternal. Uh, at some point, we will disappear. Somebody, uh, somebody, something else will 
come and see us, and possibly all the forms of memory which uh, we, we are piling up and will be able to pile up, including the memory of the, of the eyes, uh, will be very useful to those uh, people or whatever they are, uh, creatures, entities uh, coming to visit us in the future, our future tourists. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Flavio. Uh, it's time to go on. We, we have seen Greenland melting. We have seen glaciers melting this morning uh, with a, an increasing rate. We are now at about 3.4, Angelica, you told, millimeter per year, which is really, really a lot. Uh, where all this water is going? I mean, Venice, of course, is a coastal city, is very vulnerable to, to, to sea level rise. And we have an expert here, is uh, Jane Damosto. She's an environmental scientist. Uh, she wrote a book, The Science of Saving Venice, which is something that is uh, very, very important. We have to apply science to save this wonderful, this wonderful city. She also a founder of uh, a group, uh, We Are Venice, which is an independent, an independent think tank, I would say, that keep an eye on the city and what's going on. And it's a pleasure to have her here today to see what, uh, what's going on about sea level rise and the city of Venice. Thank you very much. And I'm um, going to sit down because I'm going to have to look at my notes a bit because there's an awful lot I want to say this afternoon. So, and I don't want to miss anything out. Um, we're we're here. Venice wasn't founded that long ago. Um, maybe it kind of came into being quite gradually, but it's basically here to try and improve connections between academic research and grassroots activism in Venice, but also working on Venice as a metaphor for a lot of issues elsewhere in the world. And on the one hand, we work with researchers to try and make sure that their capabilities are directed at the most urgent questions and um, and, by, and we help them get more accurate data and um, input. So sometimes researchers seem to be a little bit out of touch in their ivory towers with all due respect. Um, and the, at the same time, this kind of trying to influence the research sphere comes from working a lot with activists over the years and seeing that sometimes they're, they they might find themselves barking up the wrong tree. And maybe we can, by having better connection with the research sphere, we can sharpen their tools a little bit. So this was one of the things that um, We Are Here Venice has done um, in September 2014 in, in response to a proposal that seemed like inconceivable, which was um, as a possible solution to the cruise ship problem in Venice, the, one of the proposals was to dredge yet another channel in the lagoon for cruise ships. And our response to this was to try and turn the opposition to that plan into some kind of positive message and just to reinforce that, the fact that Venice and the lagoon are elements of a single system. and. So not only were we saying you can't think of dredging the Canale Contorta, but even in what other solutions emerges in time, remember that you can't do anything to make the lagoon more fragile than it already is if you want to protect the heritage of the city. And over 50 palaces in the space of two days agreed to hang out these four meter squared banners. And it was a nice, um, recall during the Regatta Storica, which is when there's a wonderful procession of boats along the Grand Canal, for these flags to be out there because many, many palaces along the Grand Canal had stopped participating in the Regatta Storica. And so for once they opened their windows and hung out their banners and, and that was nice. What, what I also want you to notice is um, on that map that shows all the places that had the banner, you can see how the historic city of Venice echoes 
the forms of the lagoon. And um, here you see it, a, a broader reminder, you know, just to remind anybody who doesn't know, who can't remember where Venice is, right at the top of this funnel that's the Adriatic Sea. It's in the middle of this 550 kilometer squared of lagoon. And um, in some places, although the salt marsh cover has reduced drastically in recent decades, it, it's actually, you know, 30% of what it used to be. But those salt marshes have um, unique features that are important for the health of the lagoon system and that protect Venice from, from the elements. You can also see that there's the barrier islands of, of the Lido and, and Pelestrina, and then up in the north, there's the peninsula that comes down from the Italian mainland um, of Cavallino Treporti. All around the edge of the lagoon, there's the fish farms, which are um, closed off to the normal tidal exchange. It's up to the management of the fish, fish farms when they open and close their sluices. So here's a, you can see the salt marsh at, at high tide, and you see Venice in the background, and just reminds us, you know, Venice was founded way back in the fifth century, unlike many other grand cities of the world, because it was in, it's in such a bad location, not because it's in such a strategic location, and it was only the earliest settlers of Venice that found ways to inhabit the marshes and protect themselves from their enemies. And over time, they developed such incredible ways of building on, on permanently submerged timbers. And, but in their natural state, lagoons are short-lived. And as dynamic systems, they either evolve and gradually silt up, and there's more and more marsh, ultimately, that becomes an extension of the mainland. Or if the forces of the sea dominate, the whole of the lagoon over time will erode away and become just a bay of the sea. This hasn't happened in Venice because there's been constant interventions by man to, um, to maintain the dynamic natural processes on the one hand, but also direct them. Here you can see, I just wanted to, does this point? I just wanted, you know, this was the lagoon as it looked before they rerouted the rivers 500 years ago. So what this is to say is that one shouldn't be scared of major interventions. You know, not uh, nobody is scared, but one shouldn't not think of carrying out major engineering in interventions in the lagoon if necessary and if it fits with a long-term vision for Venice. And the first example of this was 500 years ago where they decided to reroute the main rivers from feeding into the lagoon which was silting up and obstructing the passage of ships to north and south of the lagoon. And in more recent times, since the 19th century, ma the major changes have been the, the jetties at the inlets, at the, these three inlets, um, expansion of areas of Venice as well as the mainland into the lagoon, quite extensive land reclamation, as well as closing off of the fish farms, the excavation of this um, Canale dei Petroli, the major navigation industrial shipping channel, and of course before that the railroad and the um, road bridge between Venice and the mainland. There's always been a recognition of the importance of the lagoon to Venice. And um, the, I just want to remind you, I, I always come back to this plaque that's now at the Correr Museum that was um, this edict of Ignazio was done by somebody who wasn't any, he didn't have any significant role in Venice. He just carved it out. He was just a fisherman or something like that, and he delivered it to the Magistrato Aliacque to reinforce the need of how important it is that whoever acts in whichever damaging way will be judged an enemy of the nation. So since the earliest times, the importance of the lagoon system to the city has been recognized. This shows that 
you know, in some way, the form of Venice hasn't changed very much. And if um, Flavio Gregorio, Gregorio is still here, I can quote Brodsky from Watermark, where he says, time is water, and the Venetians conquered both by building a city on water and framed time with their canals, or they tamed time, or fenced it in, or caged it. And this is what we're thinking of now in terms of Venice and its tricky relationship with the water that brings its life but is also threatening the future. This is the, what I see every morning when I walk, walk to work along the Riva del Vino. I see the same thing, it seems, in many ways as what Canaletto was looking at. But um, we're very sentimental about the past in Venice and there are a lot of cultural constraints that limit what changes are possible to Venice um, in the future. This is difficult because I want to talk, you know, thinking back to the lagoon, there's been extensive erosion. The lagoon is more like a bay of the sea these days than a, a proper functioning, ecologically alive lagoon, especially s since the excavation of the navigation channel in, at the end of the 60s. And here you can see some um, data on the erosion and basically the take home message from this slide is that water level is on average three times deeper than it, than it was at the beginning of the last century. And this is what's happening to Venice. In, the, in just a month from now, this is what Venice will look like very, <coughs> very often with cruise ships at the Maritima, you know, more or less opposite where some of the speakers are staying at the Mulino Stuki. It's like adding more than an extra suburb to the city. They're not the only issue, the cruise ships, but they're emblematic of the problems. And until this, prob this issue is resolved, until a solution is found to take the cruise ships out of the heart of the city, it's hard to gather momentum on other issues as long, it just seems like we're doomed by these things. Um, <clears throat> back in the autumn when you know, one of the last cruise ships of the season was coming through Venice, I was walking along the Piazza San Marco in front on the waterfront with <clears throat> my youngest son and he's, he's only eight years old and it was dusk and there was a cruise ship just like looming towards us with all like blue and yellow orange lights on it. And I said, you know, he loves Lego, he loves robots. I said, Cosimo, what do you think when you, when you see something like that? And without thinking, he said, it makes me think Venice is dying. And just a little kid, he did, doesn't see it as something exciting. This is, so here's just, I'm, a little bit obsessed with the problem, so uh, just, it's not, you know, cruise ships bring only two million of the 30 million total tourists that come come to Venice, but I just thought you wanted to see the impact that they, you'd be interested in seeing the impact that they have also visually. This is from underneath the um, colonnade of the Doge's Palace, and, and this is Via, Gar Via Garibaldi, which is a very residential area of the city, and people are just, you know, trying to carry on with their everyday life as though nothing, nothing's happening, nothing's wrong. The, I don't, I won't, if, if you want, I can come back to the possible solutions to cruise ships, but I'd rather go forwards to talk about water level. That was just a bit of contextualizing. And this is a photograph of the tide office in, at the municipality where they keep a very careful eye on water forecasts, water level forecasts, and there's a whole siren system to warn Venetians when there's going to be flooding. You know, the, the sirens ring a few hours in advance. And in this respect, in terms of Venice, thinking about Venice and climate change, it's interesting that, you know, the Venetians have lived with flooding for, you know, hundreds of years. You know, sometimes it, there's years when it's quite regular and they have all these systems in place to deal with it that might be useful for other parts of the world where, where flooding is going to become more frequent. Um, there's a network of tide gauges that's run by the 
municipality as well as an, a network run by ISPRA, which is an agency of the environmental, <coughs> the Ministry for the Environment. And what the other thing to note is that flooding in Venice is caused by storm surges. It's when there's more wind out in the Adriatic that, that travels across the whole fetch of the long, thin Adriatic. And by Venice being at the top, it has it gets the effect of that strong, stronger, volu larger volumes of water that come into the lagoon through the inlets. It's also the only tidal area in the Mediterranean and the largest coastal wetland. Over time, looking at the trend, um, the graph on the left shows um, what's happening to water levels um, since tide gauge records began at the end of the 19th century. Here you see um, Venice is the red line, and Trieste, which is in a similar position in the Adriatic, is the blue line. The difference between the two places is because of subsidence. The industrial activities at Marghera in the up until the 1970s involved extraction of large amounts of groundwater, and Venice lost, through you know, sheer compaction, lost 11 or 12 centimeters relative to water level due to, due to that anthropic subsidence. But now regular um, geological processes are responsible for subsidence of something like a millimeter or so every year. So when you hear Venice is sinking, it's not sinking. It's more, a f it did sink, but now it's a question of flooding. And this image shows that you know, in recent years, average water level has risen by about 30 centimeters. This is Piazza San Marco, one of the lowest areas of the city, where um, a, you just need a, a, the tide of you know, less than 60 centimeters, and areas of the piazza start to flood. Um, just a quick word on um, water level me measurements, which are kind of anachronistic for Venice, but Venice is an anachronism. <laughs> It's the only city I know in the middle of a lagoon. So the tide gauges were, um, the first mechanical tide gauges were installed at the end of the 1800s at Punta della Salute. And the reference zero for tide level today still refers to those tide gauges, which are now 30 centimeters below average water level. So in my talk or when you hear anybody in Venice talking about water level, they always refer to the zero reference of the tide gauge at the Salute, which is 30 centimeters below the average water level. It's <laughs> we get used to it. But um, this, this picture is in my, um, in my latest book, which is about water levels called Acqua in Piazza. And when I was trying to think of captions for the pictures it was very close to the deadline and I said to my husband what would you write what caption would you put on this picture and he said he said maybe as San Marco starts to flood the people feel like they're at the beach and this <laughs> says a lot about the the issue of dealing with water levels in Venice you know for Venetians it's their livelihoods depend on what's happening as more and more tourists take over the the city, it's we have this. They think it's funny when when Venice floods, or it's interesting, or it's curious. And this the project Acqua in Piazza, to which the book is connected, was part of the series of initiatives to commemorate 50 years since the major flood of 1966. And um, the the mayor's office coordinated a whole set of Activity, you know, exhibitions, talks, etc., in Venice to like think back on where where we've come since 1966, and the contribution of We Are Here Venice r compared to many of the other initiatives that were more looking, just trying to remember those moments in 1966. There was a wonderful exhibition in the Biblioteca Marciana. Um, organized by the Archivio di Stato, where they pil pulled out all the old telexes and telegrams and records of 
how Venice responded back then to the dramatic flood where water level was two meters um, above, or 194 centimeters above normal, which meant, you know, it was chest height in Piazza San Marco, and there's things like Ghana sent a crate load of bananas to help the Venetians get through the winter, uh, to help them, you know. Um, but the We Are Here Venice initiative was just trying to delicately, quietly, maybe quite subtly, get people to start reflecting really on the existential relationship that there is between Venice and the tides and to understand to what extent the city can continue to support the increase in average water level and the more frequent occurrence of flooding and what, what's happened between 1966 and now um, has involved a lot of heavy infrastructure in Venice but and the people have not, the citizens, the residents, the workers here, haven't been involved very much in the policy choices made for the future of the city. And I think that's crucial to Venice's future response to climate change and many other things, is it, it needs a much stronger involvement of the citizens. And for that, the science is very important because they need to be properly informed. These are two photographs of Piazza San Marco by the photographer Anna Zemella, who also did an exhibition about Piazza San Marco on the, to commemorate the 1966 event tragedy. And um, this is just to, um, some things from the exhibition. We all around Piazza San Marco, the participating shops, bars, restaurants, hotels, um, we displayed this blue line on their windows to show where water level reached in 1966 to make people aware of you know what flooding can do in Venice and may yet do while we're waiting for them to complete construction of the mobile barriers that are due to to be finished in 2018 but nobody is saying exactly when not even the people that are building them but here, this is just an example of how flooding affects different places differently throughout the city. Um, these are just various shops in, in the area of Piazza San Marco and how they're all at different levels. This Giulia Nardi is on the higher side, the Procuratia Nuove, where there's a whole, where there's some steps leading up to the shop levels. Whereas the Olivetti shop, which was very important piece of architecture by Carlo Scarpa, that's at 80 centimeters. So you just need water level to rise um, 50 centimeters from average for them to have to put these big steel panels across their doorway. And um, the Griti, uh, that used to go underwater at 101 centimeters, but they've done extensive tanking with reinforced concrete so they now are high and dry up until 175 centimeters. This shows Venice is very well prepared for rising water levels because we have things like the Ramsey system developed by Insula which is the urban maintenance company and this shows changing ground level across Piazza San Marco to one centimeter accuracy in those contour lines. Here you see um, this picture on the left is, is the, the Gritty Palace Hotel before they did all the tanking work um, to protect themselves from um, flooding. And this is what they had to do every time there was water level above a meter. They had to move all the furniture out of the lobby and into the back rooms of the hotel and, and their guests had to walk along these um, duck boards to get out of the hotel and when I was talking to one of the porters there he, he used to work there before the restoration work which was completed in 2013 and he remembers the old days and he said that's how they got across the lobby but then when they got out there was nowhere for them to go you know because the campo outside is flooded too um, this is this is a very happy um, cook at, at Cafe Quadri, I think, and, 
and this is shows you know sometimes the tourists stay and for their drinks and even though the waiters have to work in the flooded conditions just quickly the frequency of um, flooding you can see um, just like one of the this morning speakers I divided it into 10-year chunks so you can see the frequency of water level above 80 centimeters which is when areas of Venice start to flood is increasing consistently over the years what's not consistent is the trend in extreme events when water levels are above 110 or 140 centimeters and that um, we'll have to see what what trends emerge with that this is another part of the exhibition some photographs each place that had the blue line also had a mini installation about some aspect of flooding and what's interesting to tell you now even though the exhibition is finished is how much the businesses and the workers in the Piazza San Marco area appreciated us talking to them about their experiences their lives how they live with flooding and and for some it's a very important problem significant problem for others you know which are flooded less frequently it's just part of the pleasure of of being in Venice and um, it's it's interesting to have heard from Angelica at lunch that in in Germany they did a you know a nationwide survey of people's attitudes to climate change and I don't know of any such thing having happened not in Venice and certainly not in Italy um, in terms of responses to flooding there is the Mose system which is this big infrastructure project at the three inlets between the lagoon and the sea and what they what the engineers claim is that the the aim of the project is to safeguard the lagoon environment um, but it's really the it it's not that it's just <laughs> um, Jeff Goodall who's just written a book about climate change came to Venice and and he uses this rather awkward analogy he says the mose is like a condom it just is there for the heat of the moment it doesn't it's not really safeguarding the environment it's not improving you know interpersonal relationships making family planning a more significant part of daily life in Venice and that's really what's missing so I'm sorry if the program led you to believe that you'd be getting some answers to Venice's response <laughs> to prime climate change I'm just throwing out all the issues and and I don't want anybody to be misled that you know th think things are going to be fixed we will eventually have protection against the extreme events but places like Piazza San Marco are still going to be vulnerable because there's a limit to the number of times you can close the barriers and still maintain the health of the lagoon system and water quality in the canals um, estimates have been made that with 50 centimeters of sea level rise the Mose system will be ha will have to be used daily with 70 centimeters sea level rise it'll be more closed than open and um, the cost of opening and closing the barriers for each cycle is 80,000 euros just the energy for each time they operate it on top of that there's obviously the maintenance co costs and the commissari that are responsible for finishing the mose system won't express an order of magnitude for the co for the cost of of operating the barriers what's important for the future is to understand anything's possible in Venice it, it's it's lived through all kinds of different situations in its long history and the future is also possible for Venice but what we need is careful understanding of what's happening to the system and this is some new work that was funded by we are here Venice at the University of Padova which shows contrary to what the people responsible for monitoring and building the barriers have said is that the Mose architecture has not caused any changes in circulation in the lagoon we found that in fact we can see some changes happening um, the on the left you see the um, what how the the inlets have the architect how the inlets have, are now significantly narrower than they used to be to be to build the infrastructure's shoulders 
to hold the barrier system. And by taking um, tide data from all these different tide gauges that are part of the standard lagoon monitoring network, we've seen that the tidal amplitude and the tide propagation across the lagoon is changing. And this is, those data were then put into a model of the lagoon system. And what you can see here is that the, um, the, the lagoon is essentially divided into three circulation basins. And, what you, and between each circulation basin, there's kind of a watershed area. And the, these areas are moving. And what this means is, may seem, it, we don't know if it's good or, nobody can say whether it's good or bad, but it's certainly a phenomenon that needs to be carefully monitored in order to be able to plan for Venice's future. The next stage of the research is going to look at how this, is, what's happening to the circulation with the inner canals of Venice, which obviously affects the stability of the building foundations and the ongoing going maintenance work. And I just want to show you this um, quick film. It's only a few seconds. Ah, here. Yeah. But where you see that the flow in the canal is more like a river than just a quiet inner canal of Venice. That's just on a normal day when I was standing at the boatyard. That, that means a lot for the buildings of Venice when you think of what's holding together the stones of their foundations. Um, some adaptations have already begun for climate change. You'll see many gondolas have had to cut off the, the tip of their, the back of the gondola so that they can fit under the smaller bridges um, when water levels high. Um, the, the image on the right shows an old style of gondola. So, you know, the gondola makers are hoping that in the future, instead of doing this barbaric thing, which is cutting off the <laughs> their carefully made boat, people will, the gondolieri will choose a different model of boat. Um, there's limits also to how much we can raise ground levels in Venice. These are two children that are going to bump their head trying to go in through that door soon. And here's somebody who's gotten taller than the doorway that's already been fitted with a dam. Here you can see that, you know, um, that, that column, that's the base of a column. And you can see that this, the column dates to the 11th century. In the 15th century, they built it higher. And now they've just raised ground levels. And when you walk along that fundamenta, you don't have the pleasure of seeing the column base anymore. Here you can see some windows that have had to be bricked in. Here's some steps up through the doorway. But it's not just Venice's problem. All this area here is less than two meters above sea level. Some of it's even below sea level. But water room, it's not just water level that's the problem. It's the chronic rising average water level that's consuming the fabric of the city and the salts in the water of the lagoon cause a lot of corrosion of buildings. The po and who's going to look after Venice, which is the population crash since in recent years. And, but Venice isn't empty because this, was, this is a photograph from two Sundays ago during carnival when Venice was so crowded. So. Um, just to end abruptly, this is a quote from Vivian Westwood who says, if we can't save Venice, how can we save the world? <laughs>